How are you, Andrew? I'm I'm well, Adam. How are you? It's pretty good. You know what? Calgary's uh, fairly warm lately, and I don't want to be stuck in my office much longer than I have to be, to be completely honest with you, because I want to enjoy these nice February spring days. That's the uh, same here, Adam. Uh, should we close that or should we open that? Uh, I think we're good for now. Yeah. We'll yeah. see what the lighting is. Uh, welcome to the KeysCast podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about whatever we are interested in this week in the world of real estate. Uh, my name is Andrew Stangler. This is Adam Fife. And what are we talking about today, Adam? REITs versus direct investing into the real estate market. And I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty stoked that you have actually memorized that introduction. So I'm, uh, I'm, on I'm it. pretty proud of you. I'm, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about investments, man. I think that we have a uh, fairly exciting year ahead of us, if not a career ahead of us on what we want to accomplish as real estate investors, as real estate advisors, and just having the connections in the general scope of commercial and residential real estate here in Alberta. So I think we're going to try to dive into some specific topics about REITs, direct investings, maybe talk about syndicates, maybe talk about some investor groups, and just try to unravel as much as we can about the topics and try to showcase our knowledge and hopefully build trust and respect within the industry. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty lofty. Trust and respect, eh? Okay. <laughs> it takes time. It takes time. Um, yeah, so today we're talking about REITs versus direct investing. So what what is that? So a REIT, real estate investment trust, um, and then direct investing, we're looking at this through the lens of an individual buying a condo, a house, a townhouse, whatever, hmm. um, and then either hiring a manager or managing it themselves. And so... I think diving into the REIT would probably be the most appropriate way. And we're going to be looking at this from a fairly high level, but just a general understanding of what a REIT is, how does it function against direct investing, some pros and cons, uh, and then possibly some things you didn't think about. So uh, a REIT, you want to tackle, I'll tackle REITs and then you'll tackle direct investing. I think that's a pretty safe bet. So, so REITs, real estate investment trusts are essentially a mutual funds. So it's going to be a big basket of investments. And so what I mean by a big basket, a company is going to acquire and or build um, particular asset classes uh, that generate cash flow over time. So this is going to be uh, multifamily. This could be commercial spaces such as resale or retail um, shops, like a burger shop or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could be a commercial bay that someone leases out. Um, it also could be land holdings, but usually it's not. Some real estate trusts will um, purchase a single asset class, some, something like multifamily, and then just specialize in multifamily. And then many of them are going to purchase uh, a variety of these type of buildings. And uh, the goal essentially is just to create some type of, um, uh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, like a pool okay like, yeah they're creating a pool like smart centers right you look at smart centers they've got all these commercial developments that are all kind of what would you call it say umbrellaed under one corporation it, exactly right so the, you're you're trying to mediate risk i think is what correct I, what, what yes I'm to say. diversify so, exactly so real estate trusts often won't um purchase all in one area they're going to diversify across cities uh, and, and often across countries. And so you have a, a set amount of returns that you're going to get from them. A real estate trust is, um, is it's mandatory for them to distribute 90% of their earnings, meaning that they only retain 10% mm. of their earnings mm -hmm. uh, for reinvestment. So uh, I think from a really high level, I'm going to stop there on REITs versus direct investing. Um, what I suppose, what exactly would, would we be looking at through that lens? Yeah, fair, fairly high level here. And, and I appreciate that because we don't want to dive into too deeply what they are in this specific podcast. Direct investing is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, you've got um, yourself or a corporation with a partner that's registered under that corporation who is looking to buying direct on title investment properties that are going to produce some sort of return on an annual basis. So if you're looking at direct investments, that could be residential, that could be commercial, that could be multifamily, doesn't really matter. But I would argue as well that the direct investments are a little bit more of a riskier play because there's a, a lot more math on a high level of what you need to accomplish to make sure that you're assessing your risks before making that decision because you are taking that risk on as a individual or as a corporation rather than buying into a basket of goods almost with a guarantee of returns. 
And for those listening, I apologize. That is my uh, <laughs> my two year old Pomeranian guarding Our guarding the uh, the office door here. Yeah. So uh, something startled him. Something I'm sure yeah. I'm sure ferocious, like a small bird, or possibly the mailman. Um, uh, I like that you actually brought that up. I yeah, thought that was quite. Funny. I just I couldn't focus. I was, yeah. I was trying to focus on on what I meant by reet and why someone into, so. And here that, we have Misha in the background yeah. guarding the house. <laughs> Yeah, fair uh, enough. This is a professional setting, guys. Let's this, go. This is a professional setting. So, Adam, who who would invest in direct investing and who would invest in REITs as an investor type? Ooh, would you that, that's a, okay. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. That, that's a good question, man, because I think that it really boils down to the personality types and it boils down to the types of people that um, amalgamate uh, that actually get together. So I would argue that people that do direct investments are family members that get into a corporation or someone who might be new into the investment world. I would argue that, you know, they want to take on the risk. They want to do it themselves. Maybe they've had a little bit of a savings. Now, those who have a little bit more of a network or a connection with others that are doing bigger investments will get into REITs because they understand the benefits. So I think that's a really good question. But at the same time, it's hard to try and how would you say categorize those people? Because it really depends on the education side of things. I would say that the it's not that their lack of education, but the newer into the world of investments would go into direct investments, where those who have the knowledge and network would go into REITs. Mm. I, I don't know if I've does that kind of make sense or I, I think so. I think you probably looked at it a little bit too high level. Okay, so okay, I I, I think the the connections it's I think you were talking about who would create a REIT um, versus I was talking about who would purchase a REIT right? Uh, like an individual. So Fair enough. I think I was more getting after, I would say the people that are purchasing REITs versus people that are uh, going after direct investing mm. probably have a, a, a difference in, in personal risk threshold, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you're going to go purchase property yourself and go manage it, there's going to be a much higher risk, but there's also going to be much higher reward. It's kind of the traditional ongoings of, uh, of how, how investments work mm -hmm. versus REITs. They've had their goods and they've had their downs, but they're usually fairly marginalized in comparison to uh, direct investing. Um, for example, for most REITs, they've had a, a poor year for the last couple of years. Um, and I think that's from a multitude of issues, um, possibly with re-reporting, um, taxation. Just It's generally challenging depending on what type you hold. I know that office REITs are really, really struggling right now. Versus multifamily rates are doing quite well, but you can usually, you know, expect maybe a, between like a two and like an eight percent return. If you're outperforming an eight percent return, then you have an exceptional REIT portfolio. Mer you know, mutually, you can you can also hold um, REIT ETFs, so that diversifies your risk even further. Mm -hmm. And we were just discussing this today, right? Like you go and purchase property, and you're managing it yourself, and let's say it's a house and You've, you've sunk in all of your savings into that house, into that down payment, $600,000 house, let's say, mm -hmm. right? So you took 120000 and you sunk it into the house itself and you did a little bit of touch-ups and you went through and you found yourself a renter and and it's cash flowing. But often, I mean, in, in Calgary, how, how many properties would you say in Calgary are cash flowing over $500 a month? As are we a, talking recent investments or investments over the last 30 years? Let's say I came to you this year in 2024 and I want I want any type of property. Um, but for this sake, I think you're mo most probably, let's give it the best opportunity. Yeah, it's probably, okay. it's probably going to be a detached home. Sure. And it's probably going to be a suited detached home. Okay. Okay. So I came to you this year. Two incomes. I got 600000 You have a suited basement. Okay. How many properties do you think are, we're going to be able to find? So if you came with me to 600000 cash... I would say a lot of them because the biggest uh, the turns that I've currently seen in my personal business is people who have 20% down and they don't, and they have to leverage the 80% mortgage with the high interest rates. It's actually near impossible. There's, if you put in all the contingencies of the property management, the, the vacancies, the repairs and maintenance, finding a direct property one-to-one, -one, even if you're looking at a, uh, a full duplex with two legal basement suites, it is still fairly hard with the high interest rate environment. If someone has $600,000 cash and they're willing to put that into the uh, real estate market, it makes it a little bit easier. But the problem that I face is that the people who have 
let's even say 200,000 plus are savvy enough that they don't want to put the entire amount into the real estate market. Mm -hmm. They would rather put it into something that has a little bit of a safer return. So right now in Calgary specifically, it's very hard to find the properties with 20% down because of the high interest rate. So REITs actually make a little bit more sense in this current condition because they have a little bit of a uh, better guarantee, safer opportunity. I don't. Does that answer your question, Andrew? I, I think so. I'm going to bring it bring it back that um, that when, when we're using this example, so we can find quite a number of them at five five hundred dollars cash flow. And okay. I think based on your answer there, Correct. right? So you have twenty percent down. You put one hundred twenty into it. We can probably or almost certainly find you a suited house of mm -hmm. some sort that you can cash flow five hundred dollars a month. However, we're going back. I guess that original thing that I'm saying that the risk threshold, right? What happens when your tenant in your basement moves out and you just lost fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred dollars a month worth of cash flow? Yeah. Well, now you're in a deficit, right? Absolutely. Obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to weather that storm. And how long can you weather that storm? And I think that is the issue with direct investing, especially mm -hmm. if you're an entry level investor, is that you have to have money aside um, to weather those storms. But also, when you're making your predictions, you have to make them off of worst case scenario, not best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Versus you can look at the historical data of a REIT and you know historically and then based on future predictions what you're going to be making off that in percentage basis points, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I, Can I step in there? Yeah, I, I would actually love to just point out, and, and this is not to shit on anyone, yeah. but I would argue that from the conversations that I've had, based off of my business and my marketing and putting myself out there enough that people are comfortable to reach out to me, which is a blessing in itself. A lot of people who do direct investment off of my personal experience are not educated enough to get into it because a lot of them, yes, they have some cash saved. They've done well in the corporate world. They've saved cash. But then when I start to unravel the risks and the realities of the situation, they're like, oh, wow, that's actually... Yeah. Wow. You're right. Yeah. That's valid. Mm. So I am not trying to toot my own horn here, but at the end of the day, being able to explain that in a, in a way that people are not necessarily second guessing, but really trying to get a actual reality picture is staggering. And I would imagine that all of the people that have gone into the market in the last five years have been not educated to the point where they're taking the um, risks into reality. And some of those people actually get burnt pretty bad, right? Because they don't put that into perspective. And I don't know if that's going on to a side conversation that probably don't, we don't want to get into today with direct investment, but I just want to throw that out there because I think it's so important that people measure the risks, right? Because REITs where we're kind of heading in this conversation are very smart, but you need to align yourself with the people that have the knowledge of what REITs are. And direct investment is good, but you need to have that cushion to make sure that you can get through the ups and downs. Because let's be honest, real estate goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes way down, and you need to be able to ride those waves. Yeah, and I mean we're we're still talking about real estate in both in both um, in both areas, right? Just one is a, a much more diversified pool, mm. and then one the risk is reward because maybe we're talking about one single house, right? Absolutely. And so it's it's interesting that you brought that up. I mean. I, I would I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you that I think most people that reach out to me as well uh, don't entirely know the risks. Mm -hmm. And that's that's our role is mm -hmm. to expose those risks. But I would also say that it's the individual's choice, right, to move ahead with the risk. I, maybe it's just how I've learned in real estate. But mm -hmm. um, before I knew how to do anything, I, I did it and I just figured it out along the way. Fair. Um, and yeah, there was some poor years in there and then there was some really, really, really good years. And so... I think that comes with any type of investing, though. Like when I when I opened up my stock portfolio, um, I, I started dealing with a small amount of money, but mm -hmm. I never did any of the um, one of those like simulators or whatnot of the of the stock market. I remember right. doing it in like high school. Um, I just put in you know a couple hundred bucks and put it you know and just watched and watched. And I took about a year, probably a year and a half, before I started getting more and more comfortable with what we were doing uh, and understanding what fit best for me. And and it's kind of interesting that I think in you're you're certainly more there's more risk involved in direct investing but there's a way to figure it out as you go mm -hmm. um just what what has to be clear is that there is no like 500 dollars 
entry level step in <laughs> when you when you talk about a house. It's true. You're sinking 120 grand in. Yeah. So you fair. want to ensure that both your feet are in that swimming pool and there's going to be some education involved. It's mm -hmm. not just like a purchase and walk away type of situation. Mm -hmm. um, if it is, uh, there's just people along the line that will take advantage of you, whether it's going to be uh, the renters, whether it's going to be a poor choice of property manager, um, whether it's going to be some unforeseen costs that you didn't calculate in. Um, and, and, it, and it's interesting because the obligation with direct investing is entirely on you as the landlord. Mm -hmm. You can align yourself with people that are going to give you all of the opportunity to move ahead with that investment. Right. Um, and, and all the resources that you need. But oftentimes, uh, depending on the asset class that we're talking about, you need to know the questions in order to get the answers. Okay. Versus with something like a read, it's just an all, all wrapped in. It's just a, a one-stop shop. Where you can you can go and even with the ETFs, I mean, those are probably the easiest way to go about it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to watch the market; you sink yourself into an ETF. Yeah, or fair enough. It really goes across any ETF. Like if you have no investment knowledge, I mean, probably the best answer for you is just going to be jumping into a Vanguard and just tracking the S and P in the states. Fair enough, right? But if you have an interest in real estate, looking at a REIT, which is essentially a mutual fund, um, might be an opportunity. Or if you have more of a, a risk threshold mm -hmm. direct investing might be interesting to you um but i i think there's a third option adam and mm -hmm. um and that would be for someone in between that's probably looking for a higher return on value and, and possibly more exposure so something in REIT, you're not going to have any input you're very much a silent partner um you're just going to kind of go along with it in order to get your monthly your monthly dividends mm -hmm. and, and and in this case we should also outline that um we're only looking at cash flowing through direct investments we're only really looking at cash flowing assets mm -hmm. um and i think that's fair because most people that are looking at direct investing require that cash flow in order to get into the market mm -hmm. they might look at something like a flipper development at a later stage um versus direct investment there is no support system unless it's your family or your partners or whatever right um and the third investment we talked about um earlier this morning would be a syndicate mm -hmm. adam so what i guess what are, what are your thoughts on on directing and, and would, would it be well placed to say that a syndicate's going to kind of fall in between the REIT and the direct investing strategy a syndicate in my opinion is a decent opportunity for someone who has cash and wants to have a small say mm -hmm. right so you've got the direct investment you take on all the liability with yourself or a partner which is fantastic if you want to take on that risk or that um, reward yourself mm -hmm. a re really great for you know hypothetically you got 50 grand you want to throw it somewhere you want to have a safe investment you want a retirement you don't want to think about it you just want to invest and trust in the advisors to make good decisions so you've kind of got two extremes right you're fully plugged in or you're not plugged in where the syndicate is kind of that nice middle ground where a syndicate is more or less and please correct me if i'm wrong a syndicate is more or less a group of people let's just say 15 to 30. I don't know if that's correct or not, but you've got a group of people who all have the same mindset where they want to achieve a certain goal. They all have X amount of cash. They put it into a group or sorry, they put it into a fund. And then that fund is then invested into land development, commercial development, or residential real estate development. And they all have a say as a board to make decisions to kind of aligned with each individual's goals. High level, would you say that I am on the right path? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, the syndicate is it's called a couple of different things. I guess we should we should back up there sure. before we look Fair at enough. high level. Okay. Um it, it, I like the word syndicate just because it sounds <laughs> it sounds cool. It sounds it sounds yeah. a bit wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. So um it's it's really gonna be the fall in between. It could be any of those things. So you're definitely right. Yeah. For sure. It could be it could be ten, it could be thirty, it could be ten thousand. Um, but it's not a mutual fund. The goal of the syndicate is always to invest in usually direct investing, but mm -hmm. in large in large quantities. So it's gonna be diversifying your pit. So you can look at it from one of two ways, right? You can either function very much like a REIT where you're gonna take down a series of investments mm -hmm. as a part of the syndicate and you're gonna create um essentially businesses depending on that whatever direct investing multifamily or strip mall or whatever you're going to take down right mm -hmm. you have partners so it means a lower investment quality 
but it also usually means that you don't leverage your cash right away. And I, I think we're going to get into this a little bit more in the next podcast. So leave a comment if you're interested in the syndicate platform and we can go into the various ways of structuring it. But I think Adam's entirely right where you, you often are going to have a say in a syndicate, a small amount, or you could be a silent partner, but you're just far more exposed to what's going on. Right. Right. And even as a silent partner, you can still share your insights with, whoever the directors mm -hmm. are of that particular mm -hmm. syndicate mm -hmm. um, to be taken into account versus to go and email a REIT as someone who owns like 0.001% of the REIT. Uh, you can pretty much only almost guarantee you're just going to get some uh, PR type email back yeah. that motivates you to stay within the REIT itself. Absolutely. Um, and I, sorry, go ahead. So wh where are we going with this? So at the end of the day, I, 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 I love what you're saying. Okay, I'm not I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. And I think for the viewers here, it's kind of an interesting topic because there's direct, there's indirect, and then there is a small portion in the say of what's going on. So I think with this, and please correct me if I'm wrong, with this actual podcast, what we're trying to get across is that there are many different avenues that people could go down when they want to actually invest into the real estate market. And let's, let's be honest. The most successful people in the world invest into real estate. It could be land. It could be commercial. It could be residential. It doesn't matter. That's kind of a wild thing. You think? Say. You it's, think? Really? I, I'd say on average, if we created the bench line of the most amount of wealth across the most amount okay. of families, it's invested in real estate. Sure. I think that the most successful people in the world do invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd make the claim that the rich people in the world made their money from real estate. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, those are from, I mean, sure. Absolutely. Even, not. even on the Forbes top 10 list, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if any of those 10 made it in real estate. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they made a lot of money in real estate, mm. but um, you know, you had George Soros in, in communications or telecommunications. You have uh, Bezos, obviously Amazon, you got Elon Musk, obviously Tesla, Starlink, um, PayPal, all of those companies. Uh, you have Warren Buffett who made it in the stock market. I don't even know if he's in the top ten. But thank you for correcting me, man. I I love I, that. Well, I don't I don't think you're wrong. Yeah. I, just, I just think we need to. Um, I just think it needed a little bit more specification. Yeah. I, I know that all of those people at some point were invested either directly or indirectly mm -hmm. in real estate. So mm -hmm. the wealth creation very much did come from there. Um, but I don't think that I'm like a Grant Cardone type that uh, nine out of ten true yeah, <laughs> yeah Grant Fair Grant Cardone type yeah. like invest investor trust yeah, in me yeah, type yeah, situation yeah. Um, that's valid but I think putting what you're saying into context is that the most amount of self made millionaires I think it's like nine nine out of ten self made millionaires did so out of real estate mm -hmm. and so if we're not talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars but we're talking about people who net worths from 10 to 50 million dollars mm -hmm. good chance that real estate was part of that portfolio mm -hmm. if not the portfolio mm -hmm. yeah this is an interesting and i apologize for the viewers out there and i'm going to just say this on behalf of myself is yeah. that we do jump we do jump around in these conversations because this is actually very fascinating for us both yeah right investing into real estate has so many different avenues that we want to try to encompass everything in this 30 to 45 minute podcast, which is very difficult because you make a statement, I go on a tangent. I make a statement, you go on a tangent and it happens. And unfortunately, we're new at this. So please cut us some slack. Let us know in the comments if we're doing things that you would like us to do or if you would like to see us do it differently because we are still learning as ourselves. But I do want to kind of bring it back. Can I can I make a comment on that? That, sure. re that reminded me of a story my dad ta uh, told me when I was a kid, and uh, and I sat there at some of those meetings. Um, there was a uh, in Cochrane, if you're familiar with Cochrane, yeah, just outside of Calgary, mm -hmm. that's where I grew up. And um, there was uh, when I was a kid, there was a single Tim Hortons there, and at like six thirty seven in the morning, that was the hot spot for developers in in Calgary and surrounding area to go and meet and have coffee. Mm -hmm. And it was such a fascinating table to sit at. Um, but my dad, he was he was starting out in, in development. He was in real estate for quite, quite some time. And so he's looking for advice. So he approaches things very much like I do that. Um, he goes to people that have done. And then he asks for their advice. But then he asks a wide variety of people. Because real estate is something that's been done for years and years and years and years. So you can just ask. And, 
And so he always said that he would go and he'd have a particular problem at the development. And he'd go sit at this table. So imagine like 15, um, 15 people sitting there that, uh, you know, did a large sum of the development land and building and otherwise in Calgary. Mm-hmm. Um, and he would pose the question. And if there's 15 people sitting there, he'd get 15 different answers. Yeah. And that's fair. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, it's kind of one of those things about real estate that, um, there really is no wrong answer. There's an infinite amount of ways to approach problem. Mm. Um, some of them are right. Some of them are wrong. Mm-hmm. But you're only going to find that out at the end. That's fair. And that's why it's so important for people to do the research, right? And align with those who they believe are in the same mindset as they are. Yeah. Because everyone's in a different stage. Like, let's even be honest, like you're in a completely different stage of business than I am. And that's totally fine because we can still find common ground where we agree on multiple different facets of real estate, yeah. even though we're at different stages in our career. And I love that. And I want to try and... Um, welcome those who are in that stage of their career if you would or life that they're looking at real estate as a way to build wealth because there is so many various ways that they could do that but trying to find the people and hopefully those people are us to help guide them or explain the differences between the investments and that's i think what we're trying to accomplish is to try to open the door of saying, hey, there's A, B, C, D. You could do A, B, C, D. These are the pros and cons of each. And this is what we've done. And this is what we believe. And those who are interested can reach out to us. I mean, we're real people. We're human. At the end of the day, we make mistakes, but we learn from those mistakes and we grow and evolve over the years to try and make the better decisions Mm -hmm. in our careers. And Adam's phone number will be posted. Yeah, <laughs> oh, so call him directly. Uh, so let's 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 kind of. I, I, I try very hard to not go on tangents. So we talked about REITs. Yeah. We talked about direct investment. We talked about syndicate. Andrew, yeah. how can we wrap this up? Okay. What maybe advice or what? Mm, how would you say maybe next steps could those take? Ah, oh, see, I kind of lost the train of thought see, there. I, I think we, we, we've looked at three different ways to invest. Yes. And let, let's be real with the syndicate. You're going to need um, the connection and we possibly have the answer for you. So we'll bring that up for you uh, in future podcasts. It's a valid um, point. But direct and, and REITs are always accessible. You go to TD Bank and you open up a trading account and you can get into REITs. If you want to get into direct investing and you want to do it in Calgary, then you can get a hold of one of us and we can guide you through that particular process. Um, But it's going to come down to you personally and what you want to take on, you and your family. So you have to take all these things into consideration, do your own research, but also align yourself with people that have done it, right? It's... um, it's fairly concerning. I mean, we were, we were talking about this yesterday. I couldn't even believe this quote. It was like over 80% of, um, of real estate professionals in Calgary, they may own a home themselves, but they actually don't invest. They invest in other things. And Correct. And we found that in our practice. I mean, every type of like crypto scheme. And, and it just, it seems a bit bizarre that if you live in, in work in the world of real estate, that you wouldn't put your money where your mouth is, but you're directing other people to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems like a precarious uh, kind of road to walk. So um, we're very much interacting with these three levels of investing types, and we hope to bring some of that information to you guys. But um, when you're going to make a personal decision for yourself, all we're going to do is offer you the um, our, our input on that particular investment. Type, That's fair. Yeah. Right. And you have to make the decision for yourself if you're really up to it. Right. You're mm-hmm. never going to get the returns that are REIT that you could potentially get out of direct investing. Mm-hmm. You also most likely never get the losses in the REIT that you potentially could get in direct investing. So it's it's going to be a risk reward um, risk reward good. situation, mm-hmm. um, and at the end of the road, I mean, uh, we personally I think went down the direct investing road, mm-hmm. and and we found this uh, a very fulfilling road, uh, but it wasn't easy at the start, and it create it, it caused us to have to learn and shape mm-hmm. and reorganize our lives a little bit in order to encompass that type of investing. Uh, whoever says the direct investing or you know buying real estate is passive income. It's an absolute liar. <laughs> they have lied to your face. Yeah, um, um, it's going to be another full time job. There's always more time in the day. Yeah. So. so where where are we going with this, Andrew? Because I think the biggest thing that people might ask is, okay, you've talked about these three fundamentals. What the hell is next, right? So this podcast is truthfully geared towards 
developing those who are interested in investments, interested in Calgary real estate, interested into the real estate market as a whole to provide them with education, to, to provide them with open conversation of those who are actively in the market, actively advising and actively making a change in their own personal lives. We're trying to bring to the table the opportunities that we see to those who actually invest their time into us. So where are we going with the conversations of direct syndicate and REITs? What's kind of the next step here? Well, I think the next podcast is going to be diving into REITs and sharing okay. a little bit more education on the different, uh, let's call them colors of REIT or uh, not of REIT. Sorry. The next one's going to be about syndicates and it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be, yeah. uh, going on and we'll okay. edit that out <laughs> <laughs> so gotta love the editor but, uh, fair enough uh so the next the next episode is going to be based on okay. syndicates yeah. and then sorry i cut you off yeah so syndication and then and then i think we're going to dive down that rabbit hole of syndication it's going to get a lot more if we're going to call them colors of syndicates it's going to get very colorful okay and i want to do probably at least three or four episodes of that particular topic because i think it's quite important um, syndication is going to be, it's going to be a lot of trust to your partners, but it's mm. also going to be a little bit deeper of an understanding of what you're going to do, um, as far as contractually, mm-hmm. um, which would mean your particular obligation towards that investment. Right. And as soon as you go into syndication, you may not only be looking at cash flowing asset classes. This could be a development opportunity. Mm-hmm. This could be a, um, a reinvestment opportunity in the sense where you're just building something to a certain point to hand it off to another investment group, Mm -hmm. right? It could be the actual management of buildings. I mean, it could be direct investing, Um, but there's, there's going to be a couple different colors and it it all comes down to the contractual obligations that you're going to be faced with. So is it going to be a JV partnership? Is it going to be a limited partnership? What is the, what do those mean? And what are those things to look for in um, those particular asset classes? I mean, I, uh, I sat at the beginning of my real estate career, I sat through a course that was taught by a lady that um, she owned like nine properties in Vancouver mm-hmm. and she actually didn't have uh, a JV agreement or any type of agreement with any of her partners. She just put them all on title. Damn. Um, and That's intense. For those that know what I'm talking about here, I know. And for those that don't, <laughs> don't worry, we're going to have some future podcasts yeah. and you're going to get it by the, oh, sorry, you're going to get it by the end of it. So. Right on. That that's that's an interesting conversation. And I think it really stems down to it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? Who is going to give you the best advice, insight, and acknowledge the realities of the situation? Obviously, what you know is very important, and that's what we're going to try to get across in this channel. But we also want to make sure that it's who you know that is the most, I would say, the heavier levy of the two, because I think it's who you know that's going to provide you with the best insight into making those decisions. Would you agree? I, I would say so. I mean, podcasting is such a phenomenal platform, and I wish this existed when I was a kid. Absolutely. Um, because, you know, like what we're trying to get at here is don't don't go and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then pull out like a ton of debt and just go, <laughs> go buy a ton of real estate. I yeah. mean, it's it's been done. Mm. And so real estate investing uh, has constantly evolved. And, and in order to stay on top of it, like the best resources that I've ever come across are luncheons and dinners with with individuals that have done it yeah fair enough because let's be real we're not reinventing the wheel Mm -hmm. this has been done true and whether it's been done in canada or other countries but most likely you could find someone even your neighbor that's you know done this process um so if anything it's accessible Mm -hmm. and uh and that would be the most important thing to take away from this and the accessibility uh, could be as much of a danger as it could be a, a draw. Mm-hmm. But if you address it correctly, it could be an incredibly fulfilling um, path to follow with you and your family. Mm-hmm. I love that. I think we should end on that note, man. Yeah, I think, I, so I think that's a that's a pretty good place to uh, kind of draw the line here and get people excited for the next episode, right? Because I do want to unfold these types of investments over the next let's say one year like mm-hmm. this is not a conversation that stops so this is a conversation that continues to evolve as calgary grows as alberta grows as canada grows all of these different topics are going to kind of evolve into something that is ever-changing mm-hmm. and we want to try to stay on top of it as best as we can for you so andrew how do we wrap this up thanks for watching we're gonna catch you <laughs> in the next one thank you very much We'll see you on the next one.